Hello viewers, my name is Ian Bennett and I'll be your host for another episode of In the Hot Seat. I'd like you to join me inside the offices of Mr. Fitz Jackson, the Member of Parliament for St. Catherine South Constituency. Join me inside so we can get a better feel of just who is Mr. Fitz Jackson. Thanks viewers for joining us for another episode of In the Hot Seat. We're here with MP Fitz Jackson. And um, even though the show is named In the Hot Seat, it's quite apparent that MP Fitz Jackson has been around for quite a while. So I, I personally wouldn't necessarily call his seat a hot seat, but what do you, what do you think? First of all, I must say thanks to you, Mr. Bennett for providing me or inviting me to share in this little chit chat with you. You're welcome. Um, as you have requested. And I guess it will give an opportunity for persons to know that I'm a human being too. And I'm just a quote unquote politician. You, know? um, you said uh, you call your program is in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. I don't consider it really hot you know, the seed provides an opportunity for service. And um, that's the biggest and most noble activity one can get involved in service to your fellow people and to your country. Exactly how many terms? Actually, it is my seventh term. I was first elected in a by-election in 1994, following the general election in 1993. And I have successfully um, contested and reelected um, in the seat, uh, which is for me is an honor, something I don't take for granted. Because my election and my reelection is a statement of trust and confidence by the people. And that imposes a responsibility and an obligation to those who are put in the office and service to them, which gives you an opportunity to make a contribution. So, you know, the issues might be hot, and yes, they are hot issues because they impact on people's lives. In the constituency that I represent, and nationally, in the parliament that I serve, and of course, in the past, we have served in a number of different ministries as Minister of State. So, it's, not a, it, it, it's a hot in terms of service, but it's not an intolerable hotness. Okay. All right, um, as I said before, some questions here for you to answer. Um, tell us about someone who you have loved and who, you know, and why you have loved them. Well, there are many persons who I have loved and continue to love, numerous persons. And you know the nature of the relationships will, will vary depending on the person in your life. Um, my immediate family, um, my political family here in South St. Catherine and the People's National Party who have worked um, closely for a number of years and they are literally like family members. And my constituents, you know, having served for as long as I have served, we develop relations, very deep, strong relationship. Persons who the entire family members are close to from grandmother to grandchild, grandchildren, across the constituency. One of the pleasurable things for me is some of the children who I know from primary school are now adults and working in the government service with me. And I feel honored because I'm some way I've influenced and encouraged, provided support for them through that journey and to see them living a fulfilling life. On an individual way, my mother, was deceased for over three decades now. But I would say she lives with me continuously every day. I think that's a singular person that has been most impacting on my life in many different ways. In terms of you know, respect for others, appreciation of others, my mother's humility, my mother's kindness, my mother's entrepreneurial disposition. Um, you know, and the one who really 
you know, kept the family together. She was the one who provided the love and tenderness which we experience as children. You know, joke about it, I might mention, when my mother died, or at least up to when my mother died, I thought I was the favorite for my mother, that she loved me more than all my other siblings. And by the way, I'm the last of eight, you know. So I thought she loved me more than everybody else until when I, we were talking amongst ourselves. And I realized that many of the things that were very special to me, they also experienced it. And that speaks to them. She, she, she shared it around. Shared it. But yet you felt that you were exceptional. And that was my experience. And, you know, having, that, having had that experience, it impact on how you even relate to others um, that you, you, you speak to and you deal with the individual, but not a group. So yes, to answer probably the roundabout way to tell you, my mother is my number one person. All right, as a young man, um, what would have been your first paying job? You know, we want to, we, we get, we're diving into who? Yeah, well, you know, I went to Kingston Technical High School and I always love to, to boast that I went to a school like Kingston Tech where they teach you theoretical things and practical things. You learn how to, make a difference in life. Um, so I, I majored in, 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 in building engineering, okay. um, which is civil. So, you know, when I was in my senior years, you know, I would do a little hustling, and I painted. So okay. that was a little, like a side thing. Mm -hmm. But in terms of being employed, I think it's my, uh, I think it was my summer employment. You know, I work a couple summers um, during my last two years um, in high school. So I got a paycheck. Um, okay. Those were my first. Well, at the end of the day, a lot of the, the I feel that having that type of exposure goes a far away in helping to mold. Yes, you know, you learn at a very early age the value of work. And um, I guess my own growing up experience caused me to appreciate the value in a variety of tasks to be provided. And so if the job is to be done and I can do it, then I do it. Um, those that involve compensation and those that don't involve compensation, um, every, every work is valuable so long as it contributes to the life, life of the persons who you serve in carrying on the job and in providing an income for you to deal with your responsibilities. Um, what would you consider your worst habit? My worst habit, not sleeping long enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. I can't think of any... I can't really can't. And I have to say there, there isn't one, but I can't think of it. Maybe I should ask my friends and family to right. give me a critique of what bad habit I have. Sometimes, um, and I remember in earlier years, my nieces and so in my son, I have two sons, you know, that's their thought. And sometimes I remember the younger son tell me, Daddy, you're wrong too much. <laughs> How many hours sleep do you do you get and how many hours sleep do you think you need? <laughs> well, the medical people say that you need eight hours. Mm. How much do how much do you get? I don't sleep more than four, four and a half hours. Sometimes three and a half or so. And that was from my early days in university, you know, because I after I left high school, I went abroad to study. And um, I enjoyed my brother and a family business there. So I worked full time and I went to school full time. So I had very short hours to study. Okay. So I would go to school in the days, come back, work in the evening, go home, and I would sleep for about four hours and wake up and do my assignment or study. You know, because that's the only window I had. Mm -hmm. And I used to work back sometimes six days a week. 
sometimes seven days a week. So I have become accustomed to it. Up until now, I don't go beyond, say, five hours. In more recent times, mm -hmm. I might go to six hours. If not politics, what would you have pursued as a profession? Well, I don't consider politics a profession for me, really. You know. I consider politics a vocation. It's a life engagement. Um, as I told you, my first, my formal training initially is in civil engineering. And then I did undergraduate stuff in, in political science, um, um, specializing in, in, in public personnel management. And then at graduate school, I did uh, the master's in public administration program at, um, at FIU. So in terms of training, I'm trained as a public manager. Okay. Um, but simultaneously, I've always been involved in business. Um, you know, after grad school first, I worked as hospital administrator at Medical Associates, and then came back. And then I've been in private business um, um, throughout the years. So I've been in bis private business simultaneously with political office, because I've never seen public earning as being I've never tried to make myself dependent on it for my own personal. So it really is more vocational then? So, yeah, yes, yes. But sadly, though, it dominates a lot of the time <laughs> and effort. But engaging income earning other than, than, than what you get from, because the truth be told, members of parliament are not paid anything to speak about. A middle manager, a branch manager at a bank, earns probably three times what a member of parliament gets in salary and benefit, you know. So there's nothing, and we have responsibilities like many other persons and your own life to maintain. So it has been a vocation, one that I enjoy doing. It allows me to fulfill one of my deep disposition service to fellow Jamaicans and, and my country. Ironically, I, I, you know, I've been involved publicly throughout community level from I was about 10 years old. Okay. And why, oh, I remember the 10 years because in 1968, I was born in 1958, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in 1968, I remember vividly when I had to run from the police who came to break up a march in solidarity with the and recognition of the, the um, Martin Luther King when he was assassinated okay. in 1968 in Lionelsville. Mm -hmm. okay. And there was a big march organized by my eldest brother too. All right. In solidarity. And apparently permits were not obtained. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole jeep load, jeeps. Um, of police mm -hmm. came and disrupted the the march through the, 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 the village. I think he may be answering another one of my questions, but then he continued. So that was my first. But you know, in high school, I have been involved all through the years in student governance, um, first form, um, second form, third form. You know, just four years in high, technical high school at the time. Second form, I was vice president, class vice president. Third form, I was form captain. Fourth form, I was form captain and became head boy and student council president. Okay. And when I left high school and went abroad, I was involved in the po po local political movement. I remember I was a member of the Young, Young Socialist Alliance. I was a member of the Student Coalition Against Racism a group called SCAR, and I've participated, I've, I've created, um, helping the creation of a new... I think you might, be, you, you might be giving away some material for my next program, right. for, for, for another program I'm going to... <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've all my life, you know, before becoming a member of parliament, I was the Citizen Association president in Elsha Heights, you know, uh, where I lived at the time. So all my life I've been involved in, in community service. You know, I, I, it's just a part of me. 
as a bit of background, I grew up in a family that has been committed to coming to service. My father was a parish councillor, and he was a district constable too, Millwide as well. Um, so you kind of grow MP in your own service. MP Jacks, we are going to have to have. Well. <laughs> Right. But let's just move on. We might have a more interesting in the, yeah. stories to, no, to talk we're, about. We're going, to, we're going to have. We're going to have. So let me just move on to the other question. Sure. <laughs> um, locally and inside the Caribbean, are there any books? Because I, I want to also give fellow, you know, the viewers an idea of some of the literature that you may have looked at. That would have played a role in, in, you know, although it seems more your life experiences might have been the one to yeah. help. Um, my first book I read, which was very piercing for me, when I was about 14, 15, um, was a Malcolm X book, um, yeah. By Any Means Necessary, um, which I found very useful because it exposed me to the real reality of black people, African American in the United States, where I subsequently went to, to go to, to school. To experience directly. At the time, I never, when I was reading Malcolm X, I never had any intention. Mm -hmm. But having read and having a deep appreciation for the realities of life of, a, of black people, it, when I subsequently went there, it actually prepared me. And of course, you have read a lot of political writings. Um, mm -hmm. Um, Lenin, Strasky, and many political writers. Um, so yes, um, those are those are the early readings of of help, I believe, to shape my mm -hmm. I would say my consciousness. Okay, the, uh, uh, it it makes the next question I want to ask you almost trivial, but I'm still going to ask because you're getting very intense right there my next question is um what if karaoke song your next career <laughs> which now seems by, by the way as i you talk about question i always tell my constituents the only full full question there is mm -hmm. is the one that you don't ask all right so long as you Let want me... to know ask the question all right for, for those of us you know out there who you know, um, there's a couple of MPs that I know that you'll always see them, you know, interacting with their constituents at somewhere like a karaoke and so on. So, but I've never seen you at one. No, look, man, one of my, one of my virtues in life, you know, <laughs> is that I try to recognize my limitation and, and stay, and stay with it. I love music. I love music. But singing, uh -huh. I don't even sing in the shower. <laughs> Listen, neighbor, hear me and call the police. Think something is happening to you. Something is happening terribly. <laughs> no, right. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't go to yeah. karaoke. I don't because I can't sing, but I enjoy listening to music. I listen to music intensely. All right. Um, if, you know, whether now or in the future, uh, autobiography was done. Mr. Fitz Jackson, um, what would you like it to be called? You know, I am one of them who never too dispose about things being named after me. And persons who know me personally, and my political journey might be a bit of contradiction because I don't like attention. A yes, politician. I'm, I'm a politician. I, I, and when I say I'm a politician, mm -hmm. I say it with pride. Because I think it's an honorable um, position to serve in. Isn't it what you make it? Exactly. 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 I couldn't have said it better. It's what you make it. You know, of course, some people talk about po politicians and some negative attributes, dishonesty and trustworthiness and all of that. It's not politics why people are so. It's because they are inherently dishonest. Mm -hmm. Same way you can have a dishonest doctor. You can have a dishonest lawyer. You can have a dishonest priest, and we see many of those around. You can be dishonest in any vocation. It depends on your own intrinsic values and your own character. 
that determines the perf that you are. All right. Um, when you first became a member of parliament, which um, is well over, easily over 20 years now, 20, 20, 26 years. <laughs> going 27, give us an idea of some of the projects that you worked on in that initial stage. You know, one of the weaknesses I have politically, and I've been criticized by my own people, is that I don't take rec keep record of the things that I do because I think that's just a matter of course to do the things that need to be, to be done. done. The work. The work. Hmm. Um, of course, I've always believed that one of the roles of government is to provide the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure in our communities. So at the community level, I've sought to do that. For example, I set out from 1994 that no community in my constituency must have running water, must not have electricity. Mm -hmm. and in the earlier days, it was telephone as a major utility, but mm -hmm. when advent of cell, cell phone, phones, that became <laughs> not a, 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 a passe, you know? that, Yeah, but roads, water, right? And another thing is access to education, mm -hmm. right? Both at the pre-primary, which is the basic school level, the primary school, the secondary, and at the tertiary level. Access to. So the physical facilities. So I can say in South St. Catherine, all the communities have close proximity to all of those levels of, um, of education and training. Um, of course, many also travel outside of mm -hmm. constituents and outside of Port Moore, um, but they have access. The access is here. But many people don't know too, you know. Many people come from Kingston to school in Port Moore. Yes. Both at the, from the primary level to the high school level. So it's a two-way track. And so we have successfully done that. One of the things which I take a lot of pride in, I'm you know, really proud of, is the creation of the Port Moore municipality. Okay. Which was initiated by the citizens, but which I had the opportunity to provide political leadership to bring it into being. And that was done in collaboration with my colleague at the time, Dr. Paul Robertson, who was the other member of parliament in Port Moore. Why that is critical, the nature of the constituency, much of the things that impact on everyday life for my constituents at the local government level, and being able to have an authority, an instrument to see to those things was critical to the improvement of lives at the community level. Simple things like the drains, trying to control the mosquito problem in Port Moore, right? And many other, the building, the building regulations and monitoring and all those things that people complain about that affects mm -hmm. their lives in a serious way where they live. We have the authority to do that. And that's for that reason why I feel like a very close working relationship with the Port Moore municipality. Because for me, it is my instrument of ensuring that my people mm -hmm. are, 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 are served in the best way possible and a way that can improve on the quality of life. So at the, at the community level, throughout the constituency, those amenities, we mm -hmm. seek to make sure that they are maintained and put in place where they are absent. And I think we have done reasonably well. But having done it, your work is not over. You have to preserve it, those. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain them. That's where the challenge is. Because while you're seeking to maintain what is in place, you have to actually create and respond to new demands mm -hmm. for more of those things in more communities. Because you're never able to do all that needs to be done. I have a major product project, one of my pet projects, which is a youth development center. I have se secure or reserved the land for it. It's right beside the health center and the church over in Greater Port Moore, a modern youth development center with swimming pool and art court and is a big ticket item. I've done the architectural design on it. I've done the BQ on it. We're looking at roughly about 70 odd million dollars. So if you can, if you want to give me the first 10 million dollars. I'm hearing but you. But it's really <laughs> state of the art because we want to lift 
the standard of facilities that we provide, as even this constituency office, as you might see, which is where the people's business is conducted, must be lifted to a modern and decent level. The facilities that we provide, we try to do. Okay, part of my responsibility as Member of Parliament is to also serve as an enabler, a facilitator, a motivator for our children and our people, our public sector workers, and to an extent, the community, and the community work, um, volunteer people on the other end. But so far as the government workers, I'm referring to like our schools, right, is to work in partnership with them to deliver that service, which is critical to the development of the constituents, the children, and by extension, the nation. Well, we've come to the end of our interview. And as I said before, it's a quite an illuminating interview. And not because of the, the lights, the new lights that I got for, you know. But um, is there a message, in wrapping up, is there a message you have for the youth you of know, Jamaica? Again, as I said this morning, I had a little session with some grade 7 students at a grade 4 more high school. Because it's their first in-person instruction since the school year started. And I repeat what I said to them. We are in some challenging times. Times that we have never seen before. In fact, this pandemic, none of us have had the experience of a pandemic before. So our high school years were not as challenging as it is for them. But it is the challenges that the best of us must come out. And what I want our young people to recognize, if not anything else, there is an opportunity for them to be the best that they can be. But they have to seize the opportunity, grasp for it with both hands, and feed if possible and necessary so that you can become far more successful than we were in our time. Well, viewers, undoubtedly, you got an opportunity to get to know Mr. Jackson. I myself considered it, I, I, I think I must have said it about 10 times now in, in this session. Um, it was very illuminating and not because of the lights. Right? Um, I'm inviting you to, you know, stay in touch, keep watching us, because there will be a lot more of these type of intense interviews where we'll get to know our leaders a lot better than we did before. Thanks for joining me.